Tisztelettel és szeretettel köszöntök mindenkit a mai angol beszéden, és már át is mentünk angolba. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome everybody for today's English Dharma Talk. What you heard was an unintelligible Hungarian greeting for all of you. And uh, just like Hungarian for most foreign speakers, the current situation does not make too much sense. It doesn't make too much sense because uh, now the rules are getting looser, at least all over Europe. And uh, it turns out that uh, people are tired of being quarantined. It doesn't mean that the danger is over. In fact, people are talking about the second wave. That second wave is coming somewhere, somewhere sometime. But we don't know how and when it will occur. What seems to be the case is that during the lockdown, most of those cleansing acts were missing, like mass diagnosis and mass treatment. People were confined and the spread was slowing down. Wonderful. As we say in Dharma combat, 50%. So with a 50% result, in the next couple of weeks, everything begins to return to normal because it turns out that uh, people are not just tired of waiting or being quarantined, but we cannot live our lives just in a confined home office way. We need to interact. We human beings are tremendously networked beings. And this network is what we call human society. This human society is something that we most often neglect because we believe our family, our partner, our children, they're more important and society is being taken care of by the laws and the MPs and the leaders and we pay our taxes and the rest is not much our business. It turns out it is. You may say that uh, the virus is getting weaker. It's true for this COVID-19, but the original human virus of ignorance is not getting any weaker. In fact, it has shown its full colors during the last couple of months. The human virus of ignorance, greed and anger is actually just as strong as before. Being confined to your quarters, maybe together with your family or with your pet or alone, does not automatically mean that you had a clear reflection on who we are, who you are and what you are doing. So it was a chance. If you ask me, this was a very nice warm up for tougher things to come because with 8 billion human beings, and this kind of mind quality, you cannot expect things to get better. I'm not the predicting type. I am not foreshadowing anything. But just be logical for a moment. I know it's Zen, it's not really fashionable to be logical, but you can be. It's okay. Just extend the graph the next 5-10 years based on the trends of the previous 50 years. What do you get? By simple logic, simple extrapolation, do the math. Things are not going to get any better before we change. And humanity does not seem to change dramatically or deeply without a significant amount of suffering. So look at Europe of the last 120 years. What happened? So what sticks out is the two world wars. So it took two world wars to change European society for something else than it used to be in the Habsburg times. And the remnants of the dying empire, the nation states started to war, started to fight and get some Lebensraum, more space for life. Well, what do we fight for on this planet? So how do you get more space out of this earth? Maybe we can squeeze a little more, as you learned maybe in your homes in the last two months, to squeeze a little more and give more space to each other. And if we can squeeze a little more, if we can scale down our karma, there's more space. Mind space. Heart space. A little more silence. More understanding maybe based on that perception. 
which never comes before you turn your energy inwards and you start to clarify your karma. You start to face your own conflicts. I always say that the Dharma is like a double-edged sword. You can cut your illusions or you can cut yourself. I.e. you can reduce your ego and you can increase your ego with the same tools. With the same means of practice. It depends on your direction. It depends on your motivation. It depends on your intention. So deeply, truly, the zeroth meditation instruction is there to see. Have the courage to look inside. And if you look inside, then you can become a sincere practitioner. That sincerity is missing from most parts of this earth. Otherwise, the planet and our society overall wouldn't look like this. And where it's missing most is those decision makers that are influencing, sometimes determining the forms of our lives in times of crisis. So ask yourself, do you really trust people around you? I hope so. Do you trust them in critical times? I hope so. Do you trust your leaders in critical times? That's for you to answer. You can see that every country has its own group culture. And I'm just looking at it from two points of view, making the laws and keeping the laws. A legislative system has many legs, many kinds of support. And if you make laws, you had better keep them. Like Anglo-Saxon and Scandinavian societies, they are very specific about the precedent-based law. And they make you keep it. That's why these societies are working relatively well. Not perfectly, but relatively well. How much do we keep the rules? How much do we believe in the rules? What kind of minds determine those rules? Look at the connection. If you don't believe in those people who make those rules, you won't keep them. You have to trust the leadership to follow them. So when you see countries where these huge, fantastic decrees and laws and orders are given, but a fraction of them are kept, then something's wrong. Something's deeply wrong. Deeply wrong with the way society elects its leaders, Deeply wrong with the way we trust our intelligentsia. And something is missing when we look inside whether we trust ourselves or not. So the original human virus did not disappear. It doesn't change with the seasons. It doesn't come from a Chinese food market or wildlife market for that matter. It comes from us. It comes from our minds. If we let this spread, then there will be more suffering on earth. If we eradicate this, there will be less suffering on earth. These basic equations are very simple. There's always a balance between what you think and what you get. There's a balance between the two sides of the equation, how you feel your own microcosmos inside, and what you do in the macrocosmos outside. So I encourage everybody, please eradicate the original virus. Get rid of human ignorance, which we all carry as the original disease. It's not original sin. No, it's a different story. It's just a disease that we contract and we can cure ourselves from. And that cure takes time, energy, perseverance, all these qualities that make you a better human being in everyday life, insightful at least, enlightened at best. I'm sorry to say the world has not changed much in the last two weeks. Did we change at all in the last two weeks? That's the question. So I can see a lot of faces from various countries. I'm glad that all the 38 of us are here. And if you have any questions, please send me a chat. Laszlo. Dear Sunim, I practice twice daily 54 prostrations, listening a little to chanting and 50 minutes of sitting meditation. I feel like I should practice more. I would have time for it. How to improve my daily practice? And lastly, it's wonderful that you're practicing twice daily 54 prostrations. 
Double it, like in a Zen casino. Double it. 108 in the morning. 108 in the evening. Listening a little to chanting, try to recite it yourself. Not just listening, passively absorbing, which is better than not absorbing it, but chant. Like the Korean Heart Sutra, the Hungarian or English Heart Sutra, whichever you prefer. And then the Great Compassion Dharani, the Nila Kanta Dharani. If you do that, then your chanting will have more energy, your practice will improve. If you can sit 50 minutes relatively comfortably, continue. If you cannot because your legs hurt, your back is itching, whatever, make it twice 40 or three times 30. What is important that you do this without any sense of being a Zen champ, like the champion of meditation, or kind of flogging yourself that I should do more, but I'm not doing it. Sunim didn't say I should do more. Maybe I should do three times. This is thinking. This thinking is garbage. What you need to do is set up a schedule based on these recommendations, if you will, and keep it within the day, as well as during that period of time that you designate for yourself. Let's say you say, for three weeks, I'm going to do just what Sunim said, twice 108, the three sutras, and twice 40 minutes. Wonderful. No ups, no downs. Strengthens your will. We all need that. When our individual willpower is combined, we get a good team. When good teams combine, we get a good big group. When these groups combine, we get a larger society. And as unimportant an individual may seem within thousands of people, this is not the case. We, the individuals, make up the group. Our mind quality influences the group right away. And the first area of, of observation is your own family. How you influence your family every day with your presence, with your mind quality, with your karma. How the bow affects karma. When you bow, you raise the Buddha above yourself. You leave your karma behind and you and this universe become one. This Buddha is your Buddha nature. Personified by the Buddha and put into eternity by fiberglass, bronze, wood and stone. Because that's what we use to signify this. But you may already understand that we don't bow to a statue. Hell no, we don't do that. When we bow, we leave our karma behind, experience our true nature without thinking, then you and this universe become one. We and this universe become one. The reminder for that is the Buddha statue. It's a very nice common focus point on the outside so that we could all focus on the same thing inside. This is very important. That's what makes us different in terms of mentality, approach and method from some organized religion where everything is externalized. Everything. Mahayana is very, very skillful. We have externalized objects, thoughts, ideas, systems, methods, structures, but all of them are internalized again. So, in, out, in, out, constantly. So that one moment, inside and outside, could become one. So at one moment, you would cut off your own dualistic thinking and experience something which has no inside, no outside, as duality. Okay? That's why bowing is so important. You keep bowing, your mind becomes clear. If you bow for yourself, your Buddhist ego will become this big and you want to profess that you are enlightened, that you got it. That's wrong bowing. When you bow, you become no one. No one. And then good results can appear. New someone will appear when the bow is over. Bodhisattva can appear. Tatyana, you're asking me about uh, reading short stories from Dropping Ashes on the Buddha 
before the meditation session. Yes, that's a good idea. Specifically after chanting and before sitting. Because before chanting, yeah, everybody's mind is everywhere because they just came from the ulitsa, the street right in front of you. Harasho. So when that happens, then everybody's mind is just a little bit dispersed, not really focused. Chanting focuses us, puts us more or less to the same range, same wavelength. And then before sitting, read the story. One and only one. Okay, and then you can sit. After that, drink tea with people and talk about everyday subjects. It is not necessary to comment on the stories because then the thinking mind puts layers and layers and layers of opinions over a very clear teaching. And that's not necessary. If people have very, very difficult questions, you can say, you write to the teacher. No problem. Just keep it up. Okay, keep up the good work. Yutka, an ex-classmate who lives in a war zone blamed on us Europeans because we are in silence while newborn babies are being killed in hospitals. In what way are we responsible? Are we? What should I do? For them, I mean. Well, Yutka, you should see your own role. Just to be blunt, we elect our leaders in the process of the democratic elections. These leaders make decisions about the military. The military takes up roles in Afghanistan and other you know, parts of the world. So your part in this is the election, because even if you don't go to vote, that's a negative election. You let someone else vote against you or for you. That's all. The rest is wishful thinking, emotional reaction, because you did not hold a weapon. You didn't go there on a, on a tour. You are not the soldier. You are not the leader. But nobody can say that I didn't do anything. Why? Because you were born. You're here. So you are already contributing to this because you are here. If you don't do anything, then you are contributing to the entire process of human karma with that, that you're not doing anything. Sometimes it's the best. If you cannot help, don't do any harm. So then non-action is okay. But in this case, you can. You can help. It's called chanting the mantra of compassion, Kwan Seon Bosa, for the victims. And that sends a very gentle and very subtle energy into this suffering space. And your intent may influence other minds. That slaughter is not the solution to any problems. Slaughter makes only more slaughter. Read the Dhammapada. The Buddha was so clear about it. If we listened to just the Dhammapada, not the 84,000 sutras, no Zen Kongas, just read the Dhammapada. If human beings fulfilled what's in there, we would live in harmony with each other. Tatyana, Sunim, in your previous talk, you mentioned that we have only one life. This is different from what I heard from Buddhist teaching. If there is one life only, sometimes I feel... Uh, I lose any hope to get enlightenment, but if I believe there's reincarnation, if not in this life, I would have a chance to reach enlightenment in the next life. Daragaya Tatyana, I have to say that you didn't quote me exactly because I did say that we have only one life in this body with this mind. That's the complete sentence. Of course. We keep that teaching that we had previous lives and we will have future lives. But if we relax into that, then you become the Hindu priest who says, well, maybe in a few Mahakalpas, maybe in a few thousand lifetimes, a few tens of thousands of lifetimes, you get the moksha, the enlightenment. That's uh, too far ahead. If we say that we have only this life, that's not correct. You didn't come from nothing, and you're not going into nothing. But if we don't emphasize the importance of this life, with this kind of mind, with this kind of body, with this kind of karma that you met the Dharma, you met your teacher, you met your Sangha, and you have a chance to get enlightenment, then we are doing a disservice to all human beings. We have to emphasize this. We have to be very specific and clear that this human body is a great value, no matter how much you suffer sometimes. This human mind is a great value, no matter how much you hate yourself and your karma sometimes. 
But this is the only way to wake up. Why? All the karma that you made in any lives was done with the body and the mind. It's like a specific size 48 wrench. If you want to loosen it or tighten it more, you need another size 48 wrench. And that's why we need another human body and another human mind to get the job done. That's why we are born again. That's why we are thirsty to be born again. For the experience. Also, some of us for the awakening. So this is really important to see that in this life, with this body and mind, we have only one chance. Because this mind and this body is not coming back. When you die, it's over. Next kind of mind depends on your karma that you carry with yourself or the identification. And that identity, that karma, that bunch of, you know, willpower and quality creates the next body, time, place of your next birth. And that is something we don't know. And I say we had better not. We had better do things right now, this lifetime, with this body, with this mind. So focus and accept the infinite future and the infinite past. But don't lose the moment. Don't, don't lose the importance of this mind and this body. It's not coming back. There are four difficult things in life. Getting a human body. Meeting the Dharma. Meeting your teacher. And attaining enlightenment. These are the four great fortunes. Look what we have to do to get that. Look what our family has to do, that we would get that. Look what our society has to do, so that we could practice. So our job is to recycle this merit, this kind of clarity, into society, into our families, into our relationships. So then the importance of this life cannot be overemphasized. Mate. It's great to see you too, Mate, for an Iron Man event. Well... You're right when you say you'll probably face a great deal of chatter in your mind. You're asking me what you should focus on. Your first suggestion, the breath, is fine. If your chatterbox runs infinite, during an Iron Man event, you cannot have a server farm running, i.e. long mantras are out. So if your mind is really just peeling off your breath, and you need some anchor, then use the Om Nam mantra. Om for in-breath, Nam for the out-breath. And that cuts off all thinking. And don't lose it. There's nothing else. It's like climbing. When you climb, you have two hands and two feet to get to the rock surface. You can only let go of one of them at the same time. The other three... They have to hold. So if you lose the awareness of the body, you should have the breath and the mantra. If you lose the awareness of the mantra, you should have the breath and the body, and these two will restore the third immediately. So body, energy, slash breath, and mind. All the three of them, if they are in place, you can get good results. Beyond a certain level, it's only your mind that determines the outcome. Look at the top five teams in Champions League. Look at the top 100 players in ATP tennis. Look at the best 10 teams in water polo. It's only their minds beyond a certain level of skill and training that would determine the result. Beneath that, they need to train more. They have to have more skills, etc. But if you're above that threshold, that only your mind matters, then meditation practice can further your results. You can get higher scores. I mean, Chicago Bulls, the basketball team, they were very famous for their own mind coach. They were the first in NBA that openly said that we have a coach that is not just teaching us how to dribble, how to have three pointers from downtown. They teach us how to keep our minds. Okay? So keep your mind focused and what's important Whatever happens in the body, keep your tantian focus. Your tantian focus will help the physical, the mental, 
the breath, everything. Don't think about it. Not before, not during, not after. Just do that. All right? Dorka. What happens if someone feels that rebirth does not help because one feels so stupid to change and like a fly try to escape through a clean window and always knocked down by the window, something like this. So what does one do when we feel too stupid? Then you have to get out of the study room where you feel stupid. You have to get out of this mind, this thinking, which believes in these ideas that stupidity and rebirth have anything in common or in connection. Try and lose your ignorance through clear practice. So when your mind returns before thinking, then there is no duality, whether ignorant duality, stupid duality, clever duality, it's all gone. So return to the sky is blue, the trees are green truth, because that has no stupid or clever. It's just like this. Then treat your thoughts just like this, your own speech just like this. Don't label yourself as stupid or clever. Some people have a lot of thinking, but they are ignorant. Some people can have a few words a day, but they're super wise. So do not judge yourself. Do not label yourself. Perceive your thinking and use it to the extent you can when necessary. And do not use your thinking when it's not necessary. That's fine. Shai and his wife have a friend who got pregnant lately by a man who is emotionally abusing her. She's in a bad physical condition, can't eat crying, she doesn't want to break up with this guy and continues to see him and says that she loves him. At which point should we move from actions, material, emotional support, to letting go, i.e. more suffering is necessary? Should we end our relationship with her or him in order to emphasize the effects of their actions? Shai, you are living in a hot corner of the world. I know that. So the crisis that you mention is actually very, very real. My suggestion is neither. You're very logical. That's good. You're very compassionate. Also wonderful. And you have the passion to get things done. I know. I know you well enough for that. And I'm asking you to ask the right question to this pregnant, abused woman. Ask her, what do you want? She won't be clear about that because her mind is in an emotional chaos and pregnancy is a very difficult job. So her hormones are rushing, the baby is coming and the prospective father is not treating her right. So this is a double, triple disadvantage. Of course, you can expect that her decisions are not clear. So meet her, also Erga, because you need a woman here. You need a woman linked, no matter how friendly she may be with you, you need a woman to connect to her. It's really important. Even if she doesn't say anything, they will. And you have to be in very, very much same wavelength with your female companion. And if it's Erga, you are. It's wonderful. Ask her the question very patiently, repeatedly. Reflect on her answer. That, Is this really what you want? And outline the consequences. If you do this, that's a consequence. If you say this, that's the consequence. If you want this and this, that's the way to reach it. If you follow this way or direction, you will reach the opposite. So make her clear about cause and effect because she's not in the position to practice. Even if you teach her how to meditate, maybe keep a mantra, the mind just, boom, goes away doesn't stay focused only on the physical sensations, the chaotic emotions, unresolved thinking. And it's not just bad for her, it's bad for the baby too who is coming. The baby is absorbing all this, all this, mentally, physically, you name it, all of it. So if she keeps meeting you and Erga, and she keeps listening and she keeps answering the question, Keep up the support. If she rejects the questioning, if she, if she wants things her way and her way only, and she is not listening at all, then you say you're on your own. But if she keeps being connected, 
if she's cooperating, if she's going the hard way of realizing cause and effect with your help and her help, then there's a fair chance that she will get more clear and eventually she'll use what she hears or sees. And then later on, she may thank you. Don't expect any thanks. This is very tumultuous times. The whole thing can register later much, much different when the pregnancy is over. But do what you can. As long as she keeps answering, cooperating, having the dialogue, keep it up. It helps. Well, you also say to him. So if you're connected to the man who is abusing her, then... Also, you need to meet him and ask the same question. What do you want? Same medicine. You'll get very different answers. And if she's connected to him and he's connected to her in this very different asymmetrical way, then the next question you should ask, what do you want from her? Respectively, what do you want from him? And you'll see how wrongly they perceive each other. This misperception that they allow themselves to be misperceived by the other is the root of suffering to a very large extent. So what do you want personally? Number one. Round two, what do you want from the other? And these questions will open the mind to a certain extent. Use the results. Balint. How can I distinguish between intuition and emotion? Sometimes I feel that certain emotions are encoded deep inside me. And I think it's intuition, but it can be just an old emotional pattern as well. But Balint, in your question, there's a third thing, cognition. So distinguish your cognition from your emotion and your intuition. Emotions are like this energy balls, okay? And they are connected, sometimes cold emotions, warm emotions, but they have a temperature. They have power. They move you. The slight ones, like... They are like itching or slightly downturning, but emotions have energy. Emotions have a vector. They push you, they, they caress you, they hurt you, they tease you, but all this has emotions and feeling. Thinking is much, much lighter, sometimes colder, sometimes like electrons versus the protons and strong nuclei of emotions. They all have a process. The combined process of emotions and intuition is in the mind stream. So there's always a previous thought, and then this thought, and the next thought. It's part of the mind stream. Emotions, same. Intuition is different. Intuition is not your EQ or IQ. If you want a Q next to it, it's SQ, the spiritual intelligence. But come on, it's a bad word. It's for lack of a better word. And intuition does not have anything before or after. It has no noise. It has no karma. It's the direct manifestation of your true nature. At that moment, right away, boom. As if out of nothing. As if into nothing. And when it surfaces, there is no argument. There is no two minds. There is no multiple reactions. There's just this silent echo of silence. And then later on, you can think about it. But when it surfaces, it's something super simple, but so deep. It's like these short clips of dream when you dream. But when it's a dream, then it's very short in terms of real-time duration, but the depth is so, so rich. Now, intuition is the same because it comes from a totally different place than your emotional or cognitive karma. And as you hear, this is different from the psychological definition of intuition. And I don't deal with that. The therapists do. The scientists do. I'm using intuition in the Zen sense, how it works in our realm. And of course, it touches upon other definitions of intuition. But still, it's the best Western word to demonstrate or somehow designate the function of our true nature, which has no name, no form, no coming, no going, no dualities. You know the drill. But intuition is its direct manifestation. Nothing in between. No one in between. No distortions, no transition. Boom! It just appears. And if your noise allow, you perceive it. If your noise is too much, too much thinking, too many emotions, too much speech, too many actions, you can't perceive it. 
remains in your subconscious, couldn't pierce the layer, then we remain ignorant. Then our suffering one day cleans the karma and then we see how much suffering do we need. That depends on our attachment to our karma. We attach too much, much suffering is needed. Not too much attachment, not so strong identification, not so much suffering is necessary. Look at yourself. Look at your own life. How much suffering did you need to really change yourself? Look at it. That's how identified you were with your idea. Very much identified, much suffering necessary. If you experience this, the other one was there. So be careful what you entertain. And this is a general be careful to everybody. Watch where you step. Because on the path, falling is okay. Rising is okay. But your footsteps couldn't, shouldn't get stuck. Because then you cannot move. You cannot proceed. So make sure that your sneakers do not get stuck in the asphalt. Move on. Okay? Then your intuition will function spontaneously. Because spontaneity and intuition, they are best brothers and sisters. And spontaneity, for that matter, is not being impulsive or impatient or just hungry. Galaxy says, I have very good memory for every tiny detail. I need to do a lot of effort to let go of good and hard ones. What to do? Practice don't know mind. Don't know cuts off past, present and future. And it stops the captivity of the mind in its own past. When you remember too much, then your eighth consciousness, the Alaya Vijnana, controls you. And your memory completely covers this present moment. And you always talk about the past. You can see people like that. You can't really talk to them in the present. They always talk about the past, some story, some narrative, some problem. Come back to this moment by feeling with your hands, seeing with your eyes hearing with your ears. Normally, what we see, what we hear, what we touch and taste, etc., can become a layer of dust on our own clear mirror mind. Zen is using this to the opposite. We use this momentary perceptions and sensations to wake up. That's why our method is very efficient. Use the poison in a way that it becomes medicine. So if you're attached to what you see, you become blind. If you don't use your eyes, you also become blind. So how do you see without becoming blind? If you are attached to what you hear, you become deaf. If you're not using your ears, you also become deaf. How do you use hearing so that the sounds could teach you and not deafen you? then your memory will serve you and you will stop being a slave to your memory. When you practice correctly and this moment becomes clear, then you will have what we call intuitive memory. You remember immediately what you need to and you forget immediately what you don't have to use in your conscious mind space. Comes, does the job, goes back. A very clear trap door going back and forth between your conscious and your subconscious. That's what we call spontaneous, intuitive, good memory. But the past doesn't haunt you. You're not going back to anybody's Scottish castle and uh, shake hands with the ghosts. You don't do that. Michaela, you said that I don't have to expect anything after meditation like joy or happiness, but I can't help it. Meditation gives me great feelings. After I found your site, I discovered a lot of great guidance and my life started to change profoundly. I have now a program, a ritual of mantra chanting, meditation and yoga, and I can't help not to feel happy. On the other side, I didn't see until now an angry or unhappy Buddhist monk. Well, you didn't look close enough. I've seen both and I am not promising you anything when uh, I say, you can be happy. You should be happy. I'm super happy that you are happy and that meditation gives you great feelings. But that's your result, not my promise. And when I teach, I have to be very clear and exact. 
not to produce hopes and fears. It's not correct teaching style. Teaching style is, I am very prudent and very exact. So I tell you, look inside, see things as they are, just like this. And if you get happiness, you know, at the very end, it's fine. But we don't advertise that. Maybe we should, okay? This is a great sales pitch. We don't do that. It would be so untruthful. So I'm happy that you're happy, but please, if you're sad next week or in two weeks, also tell me that. I'll be happy to see that you are honest with me with your sadness and I will grieve with you. I'll be sad with you. I'll shed tears with you and that will also help. That's fine. So one day sad, other day happy. Like they asked the master Majo, he was sick. Sir, how has your venerable health been lately? And Majo said, sun face Buddha, moon face Buddha. Attain that, then happiness is no problem. Sadness, no problem. Galaxy S9. In education, I use a lot of repetitions. How does it go with changes and transforming? Come on, Galaxy. Have you driven in a nail? You repeatedly hit the nail on the head. And the nail is going in. That's how change is enacted, by repetition. You have a relationship for 30 years, maybe your wife or your husband, because Galaxy doesn't have a gender. And for 30 years, you keep repeating, I love you. That has effect. It changes a lot of things, especially when it's very sincere. Dorka. What happens if one is dying or unconscious and meeting his or her hell, and this person cannot remember anything to protect oneself and experiences endless suffering? at least feels that it's endless. If you are next to this person, you can help by being present and not reacting to this because you can feel this from the other person that they're going through a very, very hard time. You can even recite a mantra if it's possible with spoken words, uh, if it's not disturbing for the person inside yourself, if it's disturbing, but keep your center strong and you say, what if it's you then Use your clarity, whatever you have, even if a shred, a tiny bit of clarity, a foothold of the moment to distinguish yourself from that hell. Because that hell is created by your mind. Return to this no mind. Your true nature is no mind. Return to this and this hell is just like a bad movie. And you are sitting in the audience you're not in the movie. Well, the next step, if you become conscious enough that you see that you're actually the director, you're sitting in the director's chair. No special signs, no big Hollywood trucks outside, but you are the director. And the next step, because it's not over, directing the movie is one. Next step, is getting up to the engine room where all these projection machines are. And if you stop the projection, the movie stops. You say, I'm a demon then. No, your karma can be demonic, but that's not you. Even if you created it, that's not you. But you should be responsible for what you create. What you create and you emit to the universe on a shorter or longer radius, but it's getting back to you like a boomerang. So if you can create it, you should also be able to endure it. And if necessary, change it. Some karma gets back to us after lifetimes. Tatiana, many lifetimes. Our karma gets back to us. <laughs> okay. Bože. Yes, I would say that too. So, ladies and gentlemen, we should be really careful because this boomerang, if we in fact have many boomerangs, it has various radiuses, you know, super boomerang, you throw it away and it flies for a week and comes back to you. Like this English Dharma speech has a bi-weekly boomerang, it happens every two weeks. We throw it away and in two weeks we get it back. Some of your karma is like a few hours. You eat, 
you digest it and you get hungry again in a few hours and you eat two or three times a day. Or if you're very ascetic, then once a day. But still you eat. Hunger is coming back to you. And if somebody nice and skilled is cooking for you, then you have good food. That's good karma. Okay. If you look at it like that, even if you don't see the boomerang for some time, like if it goes around the earth in 24 hours, then you don't see it for much of the trajectory. But it comes back to you. Reverse the equation. Whatever comes back to you, sometime, someplace, somehow, you started it. Reflect on that. And then you will stop blaming the world. You will stop blaming the other person. And eventually you will stop blaming yourself. Blaming doesn't work. Complaining works even less. Projection and judgments are downright detrimental. Don't. Instead, look at the triple aspects of our minds. Creation, maintenance, and annihilation. How we create, how we maintain, and how we annihilate karma. If you are very much sattvic or bodhisattva minded, then when something appears and disappears, you don't move. When your karma disappears, you treat it as liberation. You're not hankering after it, you have no remorse, you have nothing missing, no one missing. It's very much bodhisattva. If you are rajas, the usual fire, you can react in two ways. One is purification. You get purified. Karma is still there, but it's more pure. You are there, but you are more pure. And negative Raja says, uh, it's a little loss. I lost. I lost. So I is stronger there. But I can reproduce it. I can recreate it. So there's still Rajas. That's fire because it can create again. Tamas, the darkness, the blindness, treats it as death. So loss is death. Annihilation, for them, it's never liberation. It's just being annihilated. So where are you with your losses, with disappearance? Is it liberation for you? Is it purification? Is it just a gentle loss? Or is it downright annihilation and death? 100% attachment and identification and the low end. And at the high end, no identification, no attachment. It's your choice. Your mind quality determines that. And it's okay to be strongly connected. I'm not suggesting you should detach and just look at it from above and you have no connections and no relationships because you're afraid to commit yourself. Commit yourself and know that pleasure and pain are intertwined. Intimate relationships and huge losses are intertwined. Don't be surprised. That's our paradox on human relationships on this earth. And those who we love, we cherish the most, their loss devastates us the most. And we have to live like that. And we had better become aware of that. And not it, that I love you, but if I miss you, it doesn't touch me. It's not like that. It's not true love then. If I truly love you, then your absence is really sore. It's really hard inside. If I don't love you, it doesn't matter. Gergő says, I'm a musician for nearly 30 years. Playing on my instrument makes me live at this moment. No past, no future. I would say it's like a mantra. Yet, when certain types of crisis comes, I can't even touch the instrument. So it fails to be there to mitigate my fear. Mantra does work. Why can it be? Why does an old friend, an old method of mine, can help in need? Is it the nature of art? Gergő, your instrument and your karma are too closely connected. Your crisis comes from your karma. So that's why your instrument... No, it doesn't fail you. You fail your instrument. That's why you don't believe in it, because it's tainted. It's loaded with your karma. It's not something you can use in times of crisis because you cannot believe in it 100%. Mantra is different because mantra has no karma. The mantra is not yours. Your instrument is yours. Everyone can chant Kwan Sam Bosal. Everyone can chant Gate Gate Paragate. It's not your mantra. You can use it, 
but it's nobody's personal property, so it's clean. And that's why we say this kind of universal practice helps everyone, helps the person, helps the family, helps society, because it can be used by anyone, everywhere, anytime. It's not dependent on any kind of karma, like your instrument. But if you just play without thinking, and your crisis is made up of thinking and emotions most of the time. If you can completely cut off your thinking, then you can get back to your instrument. Then your instrument begins to help you because you did not attach to your karma. You didn't follow your mind stream. You didn't follow your tendencies, attachments and manias, whatever the crisis is made of. And then your art can help you. Specifically, music is very, very interesting. You know, I've been to concerts, and I probably will be. And when there is the first aviso by the conductor, when it starts, there's this moment of anticipation, and out of that moment comes everything. All the concert, all the sounds, the whole presence by audience and orchestra, it's all there. And when it's over, and the last aviso stops the music, there is this moment of infinity when the music is over, but the hand claps have not started yet. That moment is worth living for. It's worth being born for. It's worth playing for 30 years, going to concerts and spending thousands of dollars. Because that moment purifies us from any ego, from any self, from anything that constitutes our karma. And that moment, just this complete unspeakable oneness, that's the highest function of art. And I'm glad you're part of it. Andras, what can I do if someone says something and I get stressed and feel an urge to answer right away? However, acting right away can lead to more tension. For example, a colleague saying something that I feel challenging or someone saying something that I find offensive. In theory, I know I should not react. But when I am in the situation, it is so hard to resist. Why is that? Is that strong attachment to my karma? Or is it a boomerang that I may have created? Or something I should learn not to act on? What to do in such a situation? On dash, in this situation, you have to keep your mind focused. And you can keep your mind focused by asking one question to one karma. So like... Where does this come from? Immediately there is a distance. If you have too many questions, your mind gets dispersed. If you have too many mantras, you cannot hold on to any one of them. All right? So have one mantra that you can turn on in times of stress. And you can practice that in kind of peaceful situations. You have someone talking to you. Immediately you turn on the mantra and you measure your answer time. And when it's someone friendly or your, your girlfriend, etc., you can say, okay, honey, I'm going to speak with you in this relay time or lag time. So talk to me. I'm not crazy. I'm not upset with you, but I'll answer you about five seconds later than you would expect. And then you can practice that. And when it's really stressful, you already have the habit that you say, oh, my. Who are you? So then the problem is gone, mostly gone, because if you don't react immediately, the situation changes. But sometimes you have to react immediately, like if you're at a red light and it turns green, don't use the five second delay because there will be a lot of honking and swearing and shouting behind you from the other cars. So measure that carefully. And in that lag time, in that delay, you can find some insight and find a different answer. That's why in our interview style, we use the hit. So when you hit, that cuts off your habits, your reactive mind, your narrative. So then this problem is partially solved, at least for a moment. And then you can reflect, not react, reflect. It's different. Reflection is clear. Reaction is always dualistic. Be mindful of that. Mate, could you describe what emptiness means for you? Mate, I hit you 30 times with this stick. 
that would be the best teaching to describe something that cannot be described, but that will stop you thinking. And when you stop thinking, there's emptiness. Okay, so bam! Dorka. While I was unconscious, or how to say it was like a horror dream, I wasn't awake and I was scared to say any kind of mantra which I learned to help. While I die, what if that also happens? When I die, can't I help get from a master or can't I be strong and feel so scared? Look, Dorka, when you die, you are on your own. I'm not scaring you. This is for a fact. There can be a thousand people around you. You can have tons of relatives trying to convince you that you're actually not dying, that you will actually get better, but you feel you're going away. You're fading. You're on your own. Everybody is on their own. If you are connected to the universe, then there's not so much fear. If you feel isolated, there's fear. You're on your own, but it doesn't mean that you cannot solve this. Build up some good habits while you are alive. So when you're scared, you have mantra. When you're not scared, you also have mantra. When anything appears, you keep the mantra and not follow the appearance. And when you die, chances are that you can return to that habit. If your karma is stronger, your karma controls you. If your dharma is stronger, then no isolation. You're on your own, but you're not isolated. You're not alone. But you're on your own. No one can die instead of you. You will, okay? Everyone does. Keep your mantra up. When your intellect peels off, when your emotions collapse, when your uh, internal organs completely give up and you're losing your body, then what? Then what? That's why in Zen practice we say, if you're practicing 100%, then you are already dead. You experience that. Not out-of-body experience, not this new age crap. No, you experience no mind. No mind, no karma whatsoever. And if you can keep up your practice during that time, it's like going through a thousand miles of desert with a secret water reserve. No visible flask. No big water tank. But you walk and there's always water. That's your Dharma practice. So when you die, keep your mind straight, keep up the practice that you do during this life while you have a good body and a good mind. Sung San Sunim was doing really a lot of bows. Sometimes a thousand bows a day, sometimes 500 bows a day, but for many years, a thousand bows a day. Early in the morning before everybody woke up in the center. So they asked him, sir, why are you doing so many bows? And he said, no, no, I'm, I'm not bowing. No, I don't do anything. Sir, come on. Why are you saying this? We know. We can hear. We can even smell it. You're bowing a thousand times a day. Why? And he says, no, no, no. I'm not bowing, I'm just building a robot. 1980s America, people, a robot, okay? So everybody was shocked and flabbergasted. And I said, Sir, what kind of robot is that that you're building? You don't see any metal in your room. He says, now I am building a robot. When I get old, this robot will carry me. Reflect on that. Build your own robot. Because when your mind and body give up, only that robot can carry you. I suggest you build a Dharma robot, not something else. Any more questions? We have a couple more minutes. If you are thirsty, drink like I do. And if you're hungry, ask your question. Ladies and gentlemen, it's been a thrill to see your small little faces on the video screen online tonight. And I sincerely hope that one day we can practice together in our own beautiful temple which is reopening very soon to the public in line with the rules and regulations. So please stay healthy and happy and practice the Dharma for all beings. Thank you very much.